Good afternoon and welcome to EdSurge Live, where we explore the future of education and tech and, and give you the chance to share your perspective and questions. I'm Jeff Young, an editor and reporter here at EdSurge, and I'll be moderating, co-moderating, um, on how colleges should respond to the coronavirus. We actually do EdSurge Live every month, um, but this is not an ordinary um, session or time, let's face it, um, that we're in today. Um, this is the first installment we've done jointly with Brian Alexander, um, who's here on this panel of uh, video heads, talking heads with me, um, who is a consultant and tech futurist and somebody I've known a long time, um, who is, uh, has run the Future Trends Forum um, for several years now, every week, doing online discussions just like EdSearch Live. In fact, we were as I told him, he inspired us to, to start ours. So he is, it's really um, great for me to, to, to know that we could co-host this one. I appreciate this um, because, um, and we're gonna do actually one of these every Tuesday on this topic of the coronavirus response with different guests. Uh, Brian and I will be co-hosting them for the next few weeks at least on the same day and time. So if you like it or find it valuable, um, feel free to come back next Tuesday with different guests. Um, Brian, first off, thank you for co-hosting this with me. Oh, it's my pleasure. Um, I've been really excited to see uh, what you do with EdSurge Live. And of course, I'm a big fan of EdSurge itself. So it's a delight to be on here. It's also great to be with uh, Beth and with Stephen, uh, two people that uh, I really appreciate. Stephen's been a great guest on, and participant in the Future Transform. And uh, it's also good to see Michael Sano, because every week I get to hear from him and the uh, EdSurge Connect project. So hello, everybody. Great. Yeah, that's it's great. Now let me introduce the guest, uh, Beth um, Kalikoff, who is at the University of Washington, um, where she is the director of the Center for Teaching and Learning. Um, and as people have seen, um, you know, in, that was one of the first universities in the country to suspend classes um, not much more than a week ago because of the coronavirus concerns. It's kind of a ground zero of the spread in the United States of the coronavirus. So it's a tough time for them, but a time where she's been working to help them pivot to, to digital and some online teaching. Thanks, Beth, for being here. My pleasure. Thank you for asking me. And Stephen Downs, who um, someone else I've been reading a long time at the OL Daily newsletter, um, which is just, people don't, check that out already, they really should. Um, it's kind of a um, great, great resource for, for and, and just kind of a um, something that's been around so long and tracking this space. Um, and he's an exp national expert on ed tech. Um, thank you so much for, for being here, Stephen. Oh, it's my pleasure to be here. So we, uh, for those who don't know our format, um, if you're new, we welcome, well, we welcome all of you, but we do encourage questions and we try to get to those pretty soon. But I'm going to start off, we, I kind of think of this like a, I don't know how you do it, Brian, but, or in your mind, but I kind of think of it as like a good, you know, NPR talk show, call-in show, right? Where first the, the host kind of tries to introduce some smart people and get things rolling and then um, open it up to, to the callers. Um, and so I think I'm going to alternate with Brian here for a few minutes to ask some questions first, like 10, 20 minutes, and then we're going to open it up to questions. When you do have a question, and we hope you do, um, use the chat on the side to um, ask it or, or let us know you want to ask a question. And then Michael Sano will be in touch or another one of my colleagues, um, Becky Koenig, um, and maybe ask you, are you willing to come up and do this via video? We hope you will. If you want to mute your video, you can just ask it via audio, but we'll bring you up. Um, and you can um, ask it. So um, first off though, um, Beth, as we've said, uh, unprecedented time, very different time on your campus. It sounds like the University of Washington campus, you're in Seattle, um, is open technically, well, open, the buildings are kind of open, but no classes, are, no classes are going on. Um, so is that still right or have you, has that changed since last week? Uh, the, the campus is open and mm -hmm. I'm in my campus office. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but no, um, for the last week of instruction, we're on the quarter system, so that was last week, um, um, was uh, a remote instruction. So for the 10 week quarter, uh, eight weeks were in person or hybrid or uh, face to face with technologies. The last week was entirely remote and this is finals week right now. So um, we cannot require students to come to campus, but they may come to campus. That's where we are right now. 
And your president had said at the outset of this that you plan to reopen by March 30th. Is that, but now it seems like such a time uh, where predictions is, are hard. Yeah, she had said pending health department and that, uh, CDC. Respect, yes, yeah. So uh, as you gather, that has changed. Mm. Well, um, I, my, I guess my first question is now that you've had a week of, of just some time here, um, very, you know, you're ahead, ahead of a couple campuses anyway, because, because of the way things have developed. How, how are things going broadly? And, and is there an anecdote that kind of shows maybe what's life like in the teaching on campus remotely? Um, I think um, that, I mean, nobody would claim that this is a really good way to uh, learn how to teach online if you haven't been already doing it or to move from a hybrid course to a fully online. I mean, that's uh, a given. But I think one heartening thing is that everybody is very concerned, not just about everybody's health and um, security, but also about um, uh, engaging students and teaching students. And so there's been a lot of um, fast motion, but I guess one encouraging thing is that um, we've been using centrally supported technologies like Zoom and Canvas is our LMS um, to support faculty and TAs who have questions. So we are using the same technologies that they are uh, wanting to know more about. But one thing that is so the most um, heartening thing is that people are really um, learning with and from each other and teaching each other within departments. And also that academic Twitter has been very um, supportive and collaborative in uh, nationally sharing uh, strategies and resources. Gotcha. Um, Brian, did you wanna- I have all kinds here? of questions. I have all kinds <laughs> of questions. But first I want to say thank you so much for, uh, for your work on this. Uh, Beth and I and and I appreciate you coming on the program, uh, and I, I I mean you're you know one of the two epicenters right now in the U.S. and uh, I really value that. Uh, and I just want to second what what you just said uh, about two benefits or two positive features. One is faculty and staff learning from each other along the way, which is so crucial, and the other is the value of academic Twitter. Uh, some of my friends like to say Twitter is a inhospitable swamp full of Nazis and evil people, but, um, but it seems like academic Twitter is vibrant and makes it work. Um, uh, one question I wanted to ask is, um, from what we know of the data, and it's still early, but we have a pretty good sense of this, um, the main victims of coronavirus in terms of lethality are people 60, especially 70 on up. Um, how you know most of your faculty most of your staff and especially most of your students are not in that danger zone um, but they will be circulating to people in that danger zone um, so i'm curious about how you're managing this uh, you've got a, a buff 18 year old who's having a blast on campus uh, they're going to go visit their grandparents um, i mean how are you handling that circulation as part of a public university mm -hmm. um, well uh, we're posting um uh, COVID-19 FAQs and um, protocols all over uh, the campus websites on the, um, the we have a, a coronavirus homepage for the university we have at the registrar's office and at the CTL so that there are many places that if you have symptoms or if to, in terms of prevention uh, beyond all the hand washing and singing and uh, use of soap um, and uh, two, that uh, the governor, things have been changing so fast that just in the past two weeks, we've gone from being um, a thriving smallish city to um, we no longer, you know, all the theater is canceled, movies are canceled, no sporting events, um, no restaurants or bars can serve people. Restaurants can only be open for delivery or takeout. So I live on Capitol Hill, which is um, the densest, pop the, the most populated neighborhood in the state. And boy, it is like, um, it's really quiet out there. Wow. So that, um, I hope people are visiting their grandparents um, with FaceTime 
or with um, Zoom or Skype or on the phone. And in fact, in some ways, the students uh, and their families were um, very quick on this. Uh, they were understandably, as were we all, very alarmed. So right now, um, uh, and the governor communicates with us all the time. I mean, us as citizens in the state, as well as universities, and the president and provost do as well. So that um, I think, um, I'm hoping that we're okay in terms of circulation. Right now, um, we're all advised not to, to socially um, distance ourselves. Um, really? Wow. To, as of today? Honestly, uh, you know, forgive me, but uh, time has really changed the way it works for me in the past three weeks. Right. So we find ourselves in our conversations with faculty. It's like, was that on Tuesday or was that this morning? But um, <laughs> things have been changing very, very quickly. And um, my, our hope is that um, because this is finals week, we all might get a little bit of a chance to breathe and to resituate ourselves for the start of the spring quarter and also to look after ourselves. I mean, many of faculty members have kids at home and I do mean at home because they're not going to school anymore. Uh, they're home for six weeks. Our students who have children, um, they're home for, those kids are home for six weeks. So um, um, we're all um, moving at a very quick pace and trying to help each other. When does uh, spring quarter start? Uh, Monday. Hmm. So this is a new, uh, a, a, it's going to be a new quarter in a lot of ways. Mm. I'll say. Um, Stephen, I'm sorry, to, to, so I didn't mean to cut you off, Ryan, but Stephen, I want to make sure Stephen gets in here too. Um, Stephen, you're, you're somebody who's been really active and done some early online teaching. Um, and I'm curious what you think, what you make of all this. Um, and maybe some advice if you ha have some from your, um, his, you know, kind of your longer view. So the first reaction that I saw from the uh, online learning community is this is the people who are actually practitioners and researchers and developers was along lines of online learning is really hard. Uh, you need to take this precaution and that precaution and that precaution. You have to design your courses just so, et cetera. And it's a, you know, it was really negative. Um, and I was disappointed by that because, you know, we've been up to, up to this kind of stuff for 25 years now. Yeah. Um, and uh, we've learned a thing or two as a community, as witness what we're doing right here now. Yep. Uh, you know, I mean, this is a perfectly reasonable, well-organized panel discussion. Uh, with 107 participants, sound quality is pretty good, video quality is pretty good. What's the problem, right? If we're not pedagogically perfect in our presentation, I think it's okay. Um, and the message that we as, as a discipline should be saying is, uh, yeah, look, I know this is new to you, uh, but the tech has been around for a while. A lot of it's pretty solid. Uh, there's going to be issues because there are always issues. There's issues in everything. Um, so don't expect everything to be perfect. And you don't have to be, you know, a, a wizard or a master to do this. Uh, the main thing is get out there, get online, make that connection. Let people know that there's somebody at the other end of the line trying mm -hmm. to help them. And most of your battle is solved with that. And then you can get to the serious business of doing whatever it is you're trying to do. I'm, I'm curious if, if I could ask uh, both of you, Stephen and Beth, um, you know, this question of maintaining social presence is a really interesting one. Um, that's not so much a technological one, so much as one of general practice. I'm wondering if, if you could share with uh, everybody uh, what you've seen from your own experience that really, really works for this. I mean, everything from something small, like using somebody's name, um, to something large, like perhaps choice of technological platform or scheduling. I mean, what, what works for this? 
responding? Well, <laughs> uh, faculty members have been very resourceful and they always have been. So whether uh, even before this and uh, existing online or hybrid courses of any size that social learning and um, evidence-based teaching, active learning, um, um, that you don't have to jump in at the deep end of the pool um, yeah. uh, to do this effectively. And uh, I, I think students and faculty are a little, uh, are anxious about being isolated um, socially and faculty members don't wanna be considered bots, you know, like some, um, uh, correspondence course from the 1970s where um, you write things that, and, uh, and, and mail it to the students, the students mail their answers and uh, we want to be talking with each other, teaching and learning in three dimensions and uh, connecting with each other. And so uh, uh, sometimes that happens accidentally and sometimes it happens on purpose. Um, but even just um, in uh, one online course where uh, the first day you ask students um, to post a photo of uh, either their favorite meal or where they're from, boom, and just say one line underneath. It's just asynchronous and just people look at it and it's, uh, um, it, it, it um, lifts people from being text um, to being other humans, um, meeting each other on a more emotional or social level, or, you know, pets. Um, we have a faculty member um, who uh, was years ago uh, teaching an online course, and he would do video lectures from home where he kept a bunch of parrots. And he would, and one day they were super noisy and they were squawking all over the place, and he just gave up trying to. <laughs> <laughs> quiet. Yeah. He was moving from room to room, trying to, um, and finally he just gave up. And he just, he just made the video with all these parrots uh, making right. noise in the background. And he said to his students, "I am really sorry. Those are my parrots." And um, what happened was these students who had been treating him like some kind of bot started writing in, "I have parrots. I like parrots. <laughs> I have a salamander." You know, and so that he did not intend that. Uh, to be um, a social moment, but it became one because people want to connect. And it's not the medium necessarily. I mean, it's nice to have images, it's nice to have video and all of that, but you can actually make that connection in text as well. Uh, okay. And, you know, it's this back and forth and being human, doing what you can, making your mistakes publicly, all of that that matters. You know, like Brian, what you did with that. Uh, at Google Doc right off the top of all of this, humanized you to everybody else. And it wouldn't have mattered if it worked or didn't work, it did work, but it wouldn't have mattered if it didn't work because the main thing that shows here is, here you are trying to reach out and help and interact with people and people are able to contribute. Everybody feels like they're able to help. And I think that that is, especially these days, uh, is really important. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Um, I'll put that in the chat. That's a great resource. The one, the spreadsheet we're just describing is, is the one I think you mean, Stephen, the one with uh, people can fill in with colleges that have shut. And at, yeah. there was a moment where there were just a few and then very quickly it was over 200, 250, whatever it is at now. Maybe it's over. I, I haven't looked at it today. And as Beth said, it's changing so fast. Um, I just want to let everybody know we're about to open this up to questions from the audience. We're already getting some amazing ones in the chat. Um, Actually, if, if, if that's okay with you, Brian, can we go ahead and bring up our first audience questioner? Um, Before we do that, I wanted to yeah. pull out one question from the chat. Um, great, great. Stephen and, uh, and Beth were just saying, uh, this is from Brent Besson, a wonderful, wonderful fellow in Texas, who does great, great work. Uh, and Brett says, I just got out of a talk in which we recommended primarily using video recordings to keep their classes as asynchronous as possible. Um, and so I, I'd love to hear Brett more about that, um, uh, you know, why the drive for asynchronousness. And I'd wonder if it's uh, uh, partly to do with bandwidth issues um, and partly to do uh, with time zone issues. Uh, I would love to hear more, but I thought that was really interesting just to, uh, um, yeah, there's another way of having presence. The, the great story you mentioned, Beth, about uh, uh, parrots, for example, I think would work as a clip as well as a video. And uh, Stephen 
thank you for the kind words. What you're describing about uh, uh, about the Google Doc is um, the spreadsheet is something that, uh, and thanks for sharing it, uh, Archie and again, yeah, uh, is that it was literally asynchronous, even if some of the asynchronous is pretty fast. Stephen, you beat me to the posting there, um, or no, Becky did. Somebody, somebody did. Um, I think we're going to bring up Liz from the audience and um, and see if she can do this uh, via video uh, to share a question. Um, hi, Liz. Are you muted on audio? But um, thanks for for uh, for being here. Hi. Um, can you guys hear me now? Okay. Yep. Good. Um, so my question had to do with, um, and speaking with a, a university technology leader, and um, of course all of these different companies are coming forward, um, you know, with these different tools and they're um, allowing for free upgrades to pro um, accounts, which give a lot more um, control and, uh, you know, over the tool. Um, but the, the district, or not district, sorry, university technology leader said that, um, you know, it's, they're really not going to be looking at new tools um, uh, other than the ones they already have available to them because just reviewing a new tool apparently um, for them at this university would take up to six hours um, and involve two different teams working together just to get through whether or not they should use that tool mm -hmm. and basically um, having to do with the, lar the biggest issues having to do with um, data um, agreements and privacy issues. Um, and so I was just wondering, like, what it, what's going on out there in terms of other universities and how they're dealing with that? Good question. Um, Beth, please. Well, um, I can speak to the University of Washington in that um, um, everything has happened so fast that we are encouraging departments and faculty members to use uh, three uh, central platforms or technologies that are already have been in play for many years on campus and that are centrally supported. Um, so um, for us, that has been the Canvas, LMS, um, Panopto, uh, Lecture Capture, and Zoom. Um, because, and just because um, our learning technologies, academic technologies, IT folks um, have been working with that as have some faculty um, for quite a while. So that given the speed with which we had to do this um, and are having to do this, um, that's uh, where we are. That doesn't preclude a department or an individual from uh, trying something else. Uh, um, and in fact, there's, I'm sure there's a lot of conversation within departments um, or on academic Twitter about what is good for what. It's just that right now uh, we're not well positioned to support uh, questions or troubleshoot for um, um, a, a lot of additional um, technologies um, is yet. Again, people are permitted to use whatever they want and they can find maybe peer support among colleagues who are also using that. Does that answer your question? I guess, but um, if a professor uses a tool, right? If a faculty member, individual faculty member decides to use a tool, what is their responsibility in terms of letting their students know that they, this tool may not afford them the same data privacy or um, oh. mm -hmm. the same data privacy you know, um, or information sharing agreements that they might believe they have under the umbrella of the university? I'd say they have a real big responsibility. I mean, um, I know that our, uh, for example, uh, for FERPA, um, gosh, you'd want to be very clear um, uh, in every possible way with students so they can uh, opt in or opt out or and I'm not sure uh, you know we'd be permitted to um, do something where students are forced to have um, information or data or recordings for class um, shared out in the open so at least from my perspective um, that um, the university and the uh, instructors have a responsibility to be really clear about um, how the technology or class is following FERPA 
and um, giving students the option to opt out of certain things where their data would be shared. So follow-up question, I, I'm, in terms of um, coaching, I'm used to um, my background, my background is in the K-12 environment. I'm new to coaching faculty. And um, I, uh, my, my wonder is, um, in the K-12 environment, it was my experience that a lot of teachers were unaware of their responsibilities regarding data privacy through a third party tool. Um, and, uh, you know, it just, it seemed like a good idea at the time sort of right. um, scenario. And I'm wondering like, are the universe, does the university have a plan to sort of educate the faculty about their decisions being that they're probably being bombarded with opportunities to use third party tools that are not going to be vetted through the university? Um, Stephen, I don't want to monopolize, so um, I, I, I might uh, punt to you, but I will say we have a campus-wide privacy office, and uh, we have enrollment management, the registrar's office, which is all FERPA all the time, and uh, honestly, the way uh, uh, it feels ludicrous for me to speak for like all faculty here, but just if I were to guess at the general mood, we're not in a, um, gosh, this seems like a really good time to try um, uh, uh, technology because somebody on email asked me to, okay. right? We're in all hands on deck. Um, what will learning technologies be able to help me with? Um, mm -hmm. uh, so, but certainly the privacy office and uh, FERPA officers are communicating with faculty departments all the time. And um, I just have not heard of any faculty member or department who has expressed an interest in anything that's not centrally supported except uh, proctoring um, options. Hmm. Um, okay, so thank you. That's the large institutional context. Oh, um, you know, I mean, for, for, you know, I mean, and this is, this is the sort of question that I was talking about earlier when I said, well, yeah, everybody jumps on with, well, you can't do this and you can't do that, right? Um, I think that a lot of this stuff uh, is for all practical purposes being set to the side for now. Um, you know, uh, if you are frozen into a position of, oh, I can't do anything because of FERPA or whatever, it's different in different countries, uh, that's the wrong response, I think. Um, you know, if, you know, like, there are cases where uh, the institutional technology for whatever reason hasn't made it through the transition from some people using it to everybody using it. Um, and I speak from personal experience here. Um, you know, we, we did an emergency tech switch about four hours ago uh, for something because you know, the, our VPN lines were clogged. Uh, you can't just say, well, I guess we can do nothing then, right? Um, that's not the right response. So on the one hand, yeah, be aware of the privacy implications, right? And, you know, obviously there, there needs to be an opt out. But, you know, that kind of question shouldn't be the first kind of question that you're asking. I mean, with all due respect to the questioner, sorry, but you know, the, the question should be, what can we do to make this work? Not how can you be doing something wrong? You see what I mean? Well, if I, if I could, um, I, I want to connect what uh, you both just said. And by the way, Liz, thank you so much for the series of great questions. Thank you. <laughs> uh, I, I have a quick, really quick uh, fact check question for, uh, for Beth. And then I want to, um, pull up something from the chat that takes us a little bit further. Beth, does the state of Washington have any recent regulations that would require faculty or staff to protect student privacy or share data regulations, that kind of thing? Um, I don't, uh, probably the privacy office would be uh, able to better speak to this than me, but an not that I'm aware, but I do know that uh, just the FERPA uh, uh, practices is that um, 
some of these are common sense, but that they bear repeating and repeating and repeating, which is if you're going to record a video conversation for students who couldn't make it so they could watch it later, don't put it on your YouTube channel and have it available to the world. Um, you know, the impulses are good. The intentionality is good, but just, um, you know, uh, just be very intentional and cognizant about following these privacy practices and regulations. If that, I, I don't know if that speaks to your no, question. No, there's been a, a bunch of different states within the United States that have been doing this, as well as national governments beyond. If I, if I could, if I could, this is kind of a three-way branch now, uh, from Liz to Stephen to, um, what I believe is uh, Maria Ivancheva, um, who asks, um, in response to you, Liz, uh, we should be putting these questions in the broader political and economic aspects of what's happening. Yeah. Uh, identifies uh, the digital divide in terms of internet connection and access devices. Uh, she calls out private companies that may have, as she puts it, great gains from fishing in troubled waters. Uh, she comes back to data agreements, as we've been mentioning. And then also uh, universities undercutting students and faculty. Uh, online undercuts and silence is quite important claims not to speak of extra labor that's not been remunerated and is taken for granted and adjuncts can be made redundant. Um, I, I'm just wondering if either if um, Maria, if we could get you on stage uh, or, or if you could type in more and Stephen, Beth, Liz, if you wanted to develop that point further. It's a big well, thing. Sure, take that point about adjuncts who have been uh, really the, the, uh, the uh, almost unpaid lower class of the academic system. Exactly. Many years. Well, Central in Canada. Um, you know, and, and yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I mean, from my days with the Graduate Students Association, many, many years ago, uh, where we actually took the university to court over this kind of question, uh, to efforts to unionize, uh, we, we call them sessional and teaching assistants in Canada. Um, you know, to unionize them, and I know they have been in some institutions, we were unfortunately unsuccessful. So it has been, it has been a, a very long-standing issue. Um, and, you know, so it's not surprising now to see uh, the, the least well-paid suffering the most as, as we move through this sort of environment. Um, you know, I, I would certainly highlight that as a Concern. Um, I don't know if right now is the time that it can be solved. It maybe it should have been solved before any of this came up, but yeah, I guess other people have more important things. Yeah. Um, Stephen, I think that's, yeah, all these things, it seems like this whole situation we're in is just absolutely brought to light so many of the kinds of challenges in higher ed and the kind of, mm -hmm. kind of uh, slightly wonky parts of the system that we've been writing about and many and Brian and, and yeah, yeah. Stephen have been writing about for years now. But Liz, I want to thank you again, Liz, and, and let yeah. you go. We're going to, we're going to bring up Julie. Um, and, and thank you, Brian, for highlighting Maria's question. I think that was a wonderful um, yeah. distillation of kind of what she was bringing up. Um, I think there's, um, I, I think one of the things that um, I think Julie is, is going to, going to get at is another point that's really related to all of this. Um, I think Michael is, is pushing the buttons now. I'm kind of stalling, if you can tell. Um, <laughs> so go, give me, bear with us one second here. Um, Michael, we got uh, yeah, Julie. Here we go. Hi, Julie. If you don't mind unmuting, I think the default is to mute all of us. I don't know why, but maybe we talk too much. Uh, Julie, thanks for being here. And, and do you have a question for our, our, our panel? Sure. Um, I'm interested in how you all are talking to your faculty about accessibility, specifically captioning and transcribing either recordings that they're making on the fly or synchronous events. So often those of us that have been in online learning for a very long time know that our ID teams and maybe our students that are part of those teams have kind of, um, you know, dealt with the accessibility issues in our online, you know, um, captioning and transcribing for our online courses. And now we're saying, okay, faculty, go to it. Um, you know, we just saw the recording from the office, the OCR, 
um, that it still is, you know, you still need to do this necess very necessary work. So I'm interested in how you're, ha you're positioning those discussions because so often it's be like, oh, no, 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 don't worry about it. We'll take care of it for you. And now there's no capacity to do that. So when that shifts to faculty, it's a very different conversation. So I'm interested in, in knowing how you're handling that, how others can maybe develop talking points to, to share with their faculty so that they can mm -hmm. share that we're all in this together, but you might have to correct some captions using YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's a really great, great question, uh, and thank you. And again, I, um, my perspective is informed by working at a big public R1, where we have never been in the position of saying, uh, good news, come over to Jim, and he's going to caption your stuff for you. I mean, that it's not that people haven't asked for that. It's just that it's like Letitia will do it. Just drop it off with her and she'll get right. I mean, maybe there's some magical university or college where that is happening. It's kind of like the magic bean academic integrity uh, lie detector, you know, technology. But, um, but we've just never been able to do that. We can't do it. It doesn't scale. And we're not resourced to do that. So what uh, academic technologies and learning technology is our messaging um, with support from all our uh, universal design and disability resource uh, units is um, here's what you can do for, to caption or here's how you can use X that will automatically caption for you, but you need either to uh, edit or proofread the captions or to learn to live with a certain amount of imperfection. You know, here are your options. One option is not to have uh, uh, inaccessible um, videos or PDFs or anything like that. Not an option, right? So we, uh, so learning technologies and the Center for Teaching and Learning is just trying to um, offer. Here's what. Here's your choices. But one of the choices is not a private captioning valet. Yeah. If only. Yeah, I have to agree with that. Um... Uh, there's some uh, conversation in the chat area about YouTube's auto caption, but uh, yeah, it's not ready for prime time. There is a mechanism in YouTube where you can ask uh, viewers to manually create captions for your video. And I've had volunteers do some of that for me in the past. Uh, certainly not, you know, not uh, within my capacity to get my stuff captioned. You know, we run into the same sort of thing in the you know in, in, in Canada with bilingualism as well. Um, I had people back in the early days of OL Daily saying, you know, well, you know, you work with the government, your newsletter should be bilingual. I said, fine. Uh, as soon as they can put somebody on that, we'll do that. But we realized we would have to hire somebody full time as a translator just for my stuff. And that wasn't going to happen. And again, the option here is, you know, well, what do you do? Do you do nothing? You just stop everything? That's not reasonable. Uh, historically, what I've tried to do uh, is make sure that everything I do is multimodal. So I try to, uh, I always have a text uh, uh, component. Uh, I, I, have my website accessible so it can be read by screen readers. Uh, I do have images. Uh, I do have audio. Anytime I do a presentation, I make a recording, an audio only recording. I make a video recording. Um, I make sure the slides are available. That's what, that really is within the realm of possibility now. Uh, I am hopeful that within the next few years, um, that uh, automated uh, captioning will work a lot better. I did a thing, um, just a quick demo video, just a couple of days ago, in fact, um, where I was showing people how to use Google Docs and click the microphone just to see how it worked. I hadn't tried that before. And it worked really well, which quite surprised me. So we're that close. Right, we might not get captioning right during this crisis, um, 
but I think we'll get captioning right within the decade. And, and that's small consolation to people now. But, you know, it's, it's doing what we can do. This is great. great. Oh, first of all, Julie, this is a fantastic question. I, I think in the chat, you describe yourself as a troublemaker. This is the kind of trouble that you get made. Um, and uh, I, I think everybody, especially uh, live and also in the recording, will benefit greatly from Stephen and Beth's uh, experience and descriptions of practice. Um, I, I mean, partly, as Kristen Palm just said in the, uh, in the chat, captioning has gotten much better in the last couple of years. Yeah. Uh, I would also point to the addition of AI um, as, as, we, as we progress with that. But also, I wonder, slightly tongue in cheek, I wonder if transcription will be one of those small parts of the economy that does really well now. Yeah, I, I hear that. Yeah, and it's another, it is one of those things that um, there was something that I just was interviewing somebody about students' kind of reaction to a lot of this. And there's this, there was this sense of, um, are that apparently some students are asking for part of their tuition back because the education is not fully up to the par. But I do think there's, so, so some of this is like this level of like, what's good enough? I think both of these topics we've handled so far have really, the audience questions have really gotten at this, which is, you know, obviously for some people, the accessibility is not a nice to have, it's a, it's a must have to get to the access. And so I think that's why it's more front and center or like a, a, it really focuses the mind on mm -hmm. some of the questions that the, the last questioner was asking more about like, well, how can we make things even a little better with some maybe new bells and whistles and communication technology? So it's kind of this, this struggle to see where the bar can get, how can we get good enough, fast enough with this unprecedented situation? So Julie, thank you for, I agree, thank you for bringing this question. I think we have somebody, another sort of accessibility related issue by Jim um, out in the audience who's willing to come up and ask. So if you, um, uh, Michael, I think is gonna push whatever buttons, I feel, I picture we have some big console out there. Um, I think it's just a button on the laptop. But Jim, thank you for, for being here. And if you don't mind sharing with, with the panel your question. Yeah, sure. Um, so, you know, there's 115 community colleges across California, about over 2 million students. There's over like five and a half million community college students across the country. You know, and I, I'm, I'm adjunct, uh, at one community college. I also teach online from Montana State. And so we're really sensitive to this notion that not all students have, you know, great bandwidth and, and lots of great uh, technology tools. So what are some of the best practices right now while we're in this crisis to identify and support the students that may not have the, the tools to do what everybody else can do? Audio. Audio. Podcasting. Uh, streaming radio. Uh, you can get that off your phone. You can get that very low bandwidth. Um, you know, if they're not able to get video support with audio, that, that's the first thing I would say. Of course, you're assuming they have something to hear the audio on. Yeah, like, well, if they have any internet access at all, they'll be able to get the audio. You know, which they may not at home. Yeah, well, if they don't have internet access, they're not going to do well with online learning. Well, yeah, so what are people doing to help those students? Uh, one thing is to, uh, especially in the United States, so that's the situation you're referring to, uh, is to rely heavily on uh, public libraries. Uh, yeah. for, those, for those who haven't been following this since the 1980s, really, uh, public libraries have done just heroic, heroic, uncompensated, unrecognized work in providing access to the underserved. I mean, it's just a fantastic... Uh, achievement and we'll see more and more of that and they're also doing that while they have to maintain social distancing assuming that they're open uh, my county right now just yeah. closed libraries um, but I would say libraries are, are one one route I don't know about uh, Jim uh, your area uh, I don't know what happened to cyber cafes in the US but uh, there are different shops where you can just you know buy a small thing and park for a while um, I know for a lot of poor communities, McDonald's has that role. For uh, middle and upper class communities, it's often Starbucks. But um, yeah, right now they're all shut down. But that's yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, Whatever is open is the same. Sam Hartons in Canada, <laughs> of course, and in the U.S. too. Uh, it's a little bit of Canadian imperialism, which makes us happy. Um, how about the how about the identify the students problem? You know, how do how do you find the stu Do students just raise their hands and say, "I can't do this"? You can't like send a survey through the internet if they don't have internet access. 
Uh, so how do you find the students? What uh, I've been waiting to see is um, a careful survey of students. Um, now, I've heard people object to that. Uh, Stephen, you linked uh, approvingly to uh, uh, a blog post by a prof who said something like, the headline was this catch, it was like, teach badly online, something like that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And she said, we should not survey students. And I've heard that from other people as well. Um, but I, I think that's a mistake. I think at this point, um, a survey, if you can guarantee digital responses, do it digitally. If not, do it by snail mail. Um, and you know, if you have homeless students, then whatever contact information you have from them uh, to reach out. But I, I, I think at this point, that kind of information would be vital. Yeah, Beth, Beth I saw you nodding your head. What, how would, how, do you have any ideas at, at the University of Washington for identifying students who, yeah, who might be slipping through the cracks unknown to the to professor? Yes no, I would say. But like uh, in, uh, would, uh, like in uh, some counties in California and uh, Washington, we have no, no more cafe, uh, free Wi-Fi at cafes. There are, the libraries closed down about a week ago or a half a week ago, so, which is um, heartbreaking. I mean, it's a, libraries are, as uh, you know, was said, these are um, kind of cornerstones of democracy and of collaboration, and they're out. Oh, no libraries, no coffee shops, no, none of that. So um, what we know about our students in general, that is we put out, uh, you know, campus or three campus surveys on regular intervals to find out, you know, what's your access, what do you own, what about this, what about that? So we in general have a sense, but um, class by class, uh, that's a different matter. So what we've been, and for example, um, and, but it is, it does have the potential as Jim's question suggests to exacerbate existing gaps uh -huh. between the haves and the have less or have not. And, but as somebody earlier said, one of the things about this pandemic is that it has shown a light on all these gaps and problems in our healthcare system, in capitalism, in higher ed. I mean, that's just, it, it, that's my opinion. Those are the facts on the ground. So for uh, best practice or what might work, we've been encouraging faculty members, acquainting faculty members with, um, you know, if everybody has a, a functional laptop and reliable uh, Wi-Fi, yay, but know that some of your students uh, may not have a laptop, may not have a smartphone, or might have a smartphone but not a laptop, might have neither and have a cell phone where they can get audio but not video. So design instruction and engagement in such a way that everybody can participate in the same way. Not a, um, this is for uh, the people who have always had the best of technology and then the rest of you can catch up later in your, um, you know, after, afterwards. So- But if you're designing to the lowest common denominator, you're designing to the person who doesn't have internet access at all, which right. is a non-starter. It's right? a non-starter. It's a non-starter. And if you're designing, for the person who has, uh, you know, maybe a, you know, slow text space only and nothing else, again, that's a non-starter. So, you know, you can't take the approach of designing to the lowest common denominator. No, you're right. You're it's, totally right. And you know, also, um, you, you um, and we have an obligation, a responsibility, and a charge to teach everybody from where they are. Um, not just the people it's most convenient um, or, or that we're ready to teach. So the question is, how do you find out, are we losing students? How do we um, reach students where they are under these circumstances? Well, you, have calls, you must have at least call centers or places that they can phone. Uh, you know, I mean, honestly, especially now, there should be at least some onus on the part of the student to attempt to contact the institution. You know, making it a requirement for the institution to phone every single one of its students. Again, non-starter. Who's going to do that? There is, uh, you know, Beth, there is Beth. one school that did. Uh, Berea College in Kentucky simply ended classes. 
Um, their population is largely rural, um, largely lower socioeconomic status. Yeah. And they simply said, we're not going to do this. We can't guarantee reaching out. Um, I don't know many other colleges, universities that have explicitly imitated that model, um, but I have heard support from yeah. it from some people. Yeah, Beth, Beth, when we talked for an article that we ran in Enters the other day, you had mentioned that there was a laptop loan program at the University of Washington that had been pre-existing. Um, and it sounded like you thought there were some still not loaned out. But I, I wonder, do you think that's because students might not know about it or have they all been loaned out now or? Um, um, no, I, I think um, they, I don't know. I don't know why they hadn't been all uh, loaned out at that time. But all three UW campuses do have a laptop loan uh, system. And, you know, I don't have a, a good answer for the students who have no access to technology if they are not on campus. Um, and yeah. that's really key. We need, uh, um, we need to accommodate students. We need to meet students where they are rather than say, ah, that's okay. We'll just teach the ones we can reach with, um, tech, uh, with um, who have internet access all the time. I wish I had a good answer. Uh, we did have a quick question from the chat, which was, what's our time frame? How much longer do we have? So we have 10 minutes and we are going to stop in 10 minutes. Uh, we have, we're going to make sure we try to surface some of the great resources that have been posted in the comments throughout this uh, discussion, right. some of which didn't get said out loud on the stage. Um, so yeah, I would like to um, move on to, to one more audience question. Um, and I believe, um, I don't want to butcher the name, but Weizhou is um, somebody who had said that they'd be willing to come talk. Hi, thank you for, for being here. And if you could share your question. I'm, I'm... That default to mute. Sorry, we can't hear you. Uh, okay, now. <laughs> thank um, you. Thank you. My question is really to accessibility and equality. Um, my dissertation is about working with international students and my work has a lot to do with international students. So I wonder in this specific time, if your students have a lot of them among your students or international students, what are some good practice you would recommend a faculty to do when they teach to be accessible, to be equal, but also to make sure international students can not feel being excluded because maybe English level, learning habits, and different reasons? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, yeah, these questions get tougher and tougher, or maybe they're all equally tough. Um, they're Beth. all equally tough. I mean, every, every question here has, has hit at some point of weakness in the system or another, a previously existing weakness that's exaggerated by the current crisis. Well, we could start with uh, Washington, um, UW. What have, what have you, what's been your practice that's emerged? Um, I, I should say that uh, our questioner, Wei Zhou, uh, I am familiar with her research and um, I, I wish, <laughs> and she knows as much about this as anybody and more than some, but I, I will say that some of these technologies have long been used by multilingual students who are less confident about their disciplinary knowledge or their linguistic knowledge, right? So if you're using a, lect a lecture right. capture like Panopto, uh, and again, I, I wanna emphasize that the students' perceptions may not be accurate, but no matter how intergalactically stellar uh, a multilingual student's English might be, th they may la lack confidence. So if they have a lecture posted on a website or somewhere, they can go back and hear it again. Or they can go back to the parts that they were unsure about. Or if it's in economics and they don't know, uh, they're not familiar with economics rhetoric in English, they can go back and have another uh, look. But that's also true for um, English-only students who don't speak economics and it's a micro course and it's like, whoa. Um, so, so if that's me, I can go back and rewatch a, a video as well. I don't know if that speaks to your question, Wei. And just a, another thing too, for those who are using slides. I mean, I've done a lot of presentations to uh, uh, audiences that do not have English as their first language and Although they say typically don't put a lot of words on your slides, for an international audience, actually having the text on the slide 
really acts as an aid in comprehension because they can follow the speaker with the assistance of the text on the slides. So even if you don't have closed caption, if you're doing some kind of online presentation, have slides with the words uh, because it'll help that group of people. And, and, and the, to uh, add that people, uh, international multilingual students benefit from practice. Practice that's reading, true. practice giving presentations, practice reading as do all other students mm -hmm. um, for whom, um, so that remote opportunities to practice with each other, low yeah. stakes or no stakes opportunities where you can gain confidence and just get better. And uh, you know, I would say just overall in this moment, um, it's all about forgiving ourselves for errors, uh, yeah. forgiving our students and trying to attain moments of grace and uh, joy and progress under extremely uh, trying and unpropitious and dangerous circumstances for what that's worth. That's the key message here, I think, absolutely. Uh, do what you can, do it as well as you can, um, and don't beat yourself up because it's not perfect. That, that sounds, this is all very happy, and so I have to douse that happiness. Um, uh, way, I... Uh, I, I, I want to thank you for your research, which I'm eager to examine myself, and I'm very grateful to you for your question. Um, I, I want to scale this up a little bit and raise some uh, other problems, and maybe this is in the way of a question for everybody else. Um, the first is that we have the possibility uh, in many, many countries of uh, cases of bias and discrimination against uh, people on campus based on the sense of, of their national identity. Um, so, you know, in the United States, we have a um, uh, an ugly movement to declare COVID-19 the China flu, for example. That's so uh, stupid. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm, I would not be surprised to see similar um, acts of ugliness against people from, say, Italy or from Spain or from South Korea or from Seattle um, um, as a result. Um, and so that's one thing that we have to be careful of um, and, and, and avoid at all costs. Uh, a second problem has to do with international students uh, physically living in the United States, taking classes, enrolling, and doing work. Um, now, can they be sent home um, is often one question. And some of my clients have told me that they've actually, on the fly over the past few days, arranged temporary housing for international students who were being told to go home, could not make it back to their country for whatever reason, and are now living off campus in a nearby town uh, in some housing that's been quickly arranged. I would expect to see more and more cases of that. Looking further down the road, uh, and Stephen, forgive me for being a bit US centric with this particular comment, um, higher education has become globally more and more of an international thing. Students, at, at, as well as staff, faculty and staff have been migrating more and more across national borders. China, yeah. excuse me, Canada is per capita the world's leader in this. Uh, the US has done this aggressively and then that fell apart about three years ago for obvious reasons. Mm -hmm. So one thing to think about for the United States is as a result of COVID-19, as well as our response to it, will we see international enrollment drop uh, come the fall? Uh, we already know in China, they canceled many, many exams in February, um, but also people may be uh, suspicious of the United States uh, as an area where COVID may persist or be suspicious of our clumsy, halting, and in many ways, criminally bad uh, response to the disease. Um, so I, I agree with my colleagues in all seriousness. I agree with their, their questions and their support for hope and especially for grace, as Beth put it. But I also want to bring up caution for these other issues related to the great question that Way rose. Uh, yes, thank you. That's really important. And I, I would um, underline and amplify that in that in online learning environments, whether synchronous or asynchronous, because humans are in that environment, implicit and explicit bias bubble up. Um, yeah. It's not like once you're, um, you know, on a learning management system, a few, no more bias here. Um, especially now, as you say, in this current political climate, so that all of us as instructors want to be really alert to knowing how, or, you know, how to talk about this before it happens and how to uh, make transparent the way the class will roll and how we um, encourage uh, discussion, but not, um, you know, bias, how to unpack and pause and uh, um, learn and advance when bias occurs. 
for the past 10 years, I've been uh, working with departments as Wei has too, and saying, it's not about if bias will raise its ugly head. It's not an if, it's a when. And what do you intend to do to, um, from the first day to prepare for that? Um, and it's not just students either, right? It's not students mm -hmm. or student not faculty. So that's just now more than ever. Um, that's something that's really critical um, in this pandemic um, moment across the globe. But before we get going on another one, I know I, we could definitely go on and way thank you again as, uh, as thank everyone you. has, as thank you for this um, question. And I know, I don't think we've answered probably any of the questions, so to speak, as far as an answer. These are not right and wrong answers that probably are dealing with. And in fact, you know, I have seen somebody on academic Twitter say something to the effect of we have this um, unintended experiment running out there now into what happens with all. And I'm sure there will be examples of like with this switch to distance learning, I mean, broadly. So I'm sure we'll see some places that do uh, a better job than others and some on this or that parts of the various issues that have been raised in this discussion today. Um, and hopefully, you know, everyone can learn from the best practices that emerge from this situation. Um, but but then again, we're all living under this um, under this public health crisis, and and that's something that's hanging over over everybody. So everyone, be um, thank you for being here today. We are going to do this again next Tuesday um, with Brian and I, and then um, we'll have a different we'll. we'll um, have a different set of guests. Well, I guess um, we didn't pass the audition. No, Beth. it's not because of that. Stephen and Beth, thank you so much for being here today. It was uh, unbelievably um, valuable to, to uh, for me, I will speak for myself and I, I hope everyone else out there. Um, so please sign up for next week's if you haven't already. You'll get a note, I believe, about um, the article version of this and the audio, full audio and video that we'll publish after the fact, if you want to review anything that was said here, we'll try to get some of the highlights of the chat, which has been amazing in mm -hmm. uh, the going on on the side here. We can download that file and try to make the best of that come alive too. Um, thank you everybody for being here today. Um, next week, I believe we're going to focus a little bit more. This week we talked about so many things, but a lot of it on teaching. Next week, I think we're going to talk about some institutional challenges and, and, and what might happen next for institutions like colleges, I mean, and Sean Gallagher, who is at Northeastern University, is going to be one of our guests. Um, we're still working on lining up um, one or two more as well. So, and, and Brian, again, thank you for, um, and everyone who's was coming here through Brian's audience of Future Trends Forum, welcome, and, and, and we um, will hope to see people again next Tuesday, and if not there on you know, on Future Transform or on Ed Search articles or wherever. But thank you again and, and stay healthy and, and best of luck to everybody. Thank you for hosting, Jeff. Take care. Bye, everyone.